Hey friend, welcome to my channel, Karina Lude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars in history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn on your notifications so you never miss an upload. Now let's get into this video. Today we are talking about the icon, the legendary Shaka Khan. She is outspoken, she speaks her mind, I love me some Shaka Khan. She just speaks her mind. She is known for her powerful voice, her great volume of curly hair, and her charismatic stage presence. Shaka Khan began her career in the 1970s as the female lead vocalist of the funk band Rufus. She has the rare ability to sing in seven music genres, including R&B, pop, rock, gospel, country, world music, and classical. Khan, also known as the Queen of Funk, had the first crossover hit in 1984 with I Feel For You, which featured a rapper. Khan has sold an estimated 70 million records worldwide and won 10 Grammy Awards. Throughout her legendary career, Shaka has released 22 albums, 22 albums, and racked up 10 number one Billboard magazine charted songs, seven RIAA certified gold singles, and 10 RIAA certified gold and platinum albums. With the band Rufus, she achieved four gold singles, four gold albums, and two platinum albums. In the course of her solo career, Khan achieved three gold singles, three gold albums, and one platinum album with I Feel For You. December 2016, Billboard magazine ranked her as the 65th most successful dance club artist of all time. She was ranked at number 17 in VH1's original list of the 100 greatest women of rock and roll we are going to get into some things with her the beef as you can see from the title <laughs> but first we're gonna get into a background of her with her childhood her beauty secrets diet because she was a style icon a beauty icon so we're gonna get into those things first and a little bit of controversy just to give you a preview of just how outspoken she is when she was asked what is the worst thing anyone has ever said to you she replied saying, when I was in my 30s, a manager once told me I was worth more money dead than alive. It was probably the truth. I was using substances and I was getting pretty high all the time. I think he even had an insurance policy out on me. His bet was that I wasn't going to make it, end quote. I try to tell y'all in many of these videos that these people are worth more dead than alive. And sometimes these execs be taking out insurance policies on them and ending them prematurely just because they're tired of them. They're not cooperating and they just want to have their way. And Shaka Khan has been known to be pretty outspoken on that. Khan is a vegan who states she went vegan to lose weight and combat high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. She now prefers simple foods in keeping with her practice of Yoruba, an African inspired religion whose members follow dietary restrictions in an effort to live simpler lifestyles. She compares her way of life to Ramadan, the holy month of fasting in Islam. Every day, Khan waits until close to 6 p.m. to eat, and when she does, it's typically just vegetables and green tea, and later she eats more vegetables along with some wheat noodles or a bowl of soup. She occasionally eats a small amount of fish, but most of the time a plate of vegetables and a spoonful of yogurt. When she was 13, she started taking an active interest in the world and joined a Southside Afro Arts Center, her food and way of life suddenly changed. Every month, she observed a one-week water-only fast. She baked her own bread and ate as, as fresh as she could. Khan is her own most trusted makeup artist, mostly, she taught herself. She said, I have put my makeup on in the back of limousines, on the way to gigs, long hauls on tour and on stage have proven what works best when it comes to comfort, lighting, and sweat. I designed all my own stuff, I always have, and, um, you know, sort of like the, the bra, you know, the fur bras, I, I designed those, you know, so it's, <laughs> and the leather and feathers, it was just the stuff I like to wear. 
And it was just, that's just, it's really simple as that. There was no like really major marketing plan where you sat down and thought, well, what look should you have? Or it wasn't anything like that. She also has a wig collection called Shaka by Indique. It's only natural because when she was younger, she loved experimenting with her hair. She wore a small afro during her Black Panther era and grew it out to an iconic fro over time. She often wore hair pieces when on the road and was not shy when it came to how big she wanted her hair and playing with different colors. And on that note, doesn't she look a lot like Nicki Minaj? I saw that a lot online too. Too many people thought the same thing. Like they could be sisters or that could be her aunt. Her style also almost reminds me of SZA, very eclectic and bold. I can imagine the impact Shaka would have had if she came out in this era with the help of streams and you know having more control over your artistry etc. She would have eaten all the girls up okay. With that said let's jump into her childhood. Yvette Marie Stevens was born on March 23rd, 1953 in Chicago, Illinois to a creative, free-spirited family. Her name wasn't always Shaka Khan. She is a Blackfoot Native American with French and African roots. She is the eldest of her parents, Charles Stevens and Sandra Coleman's five children. Her mother was faithful in the Catholic faith, but her father was a rebel without a cause. She said, my sister and I used to go on his midnight expeditions by the lake in the park. And though money was tight, I lived a very fantastic life. There was always a good supply cannabis, booze, and music. In an interview with the Daily Mail, she said, I was a really quiet kid, a loner. When our house was joyful, it was ever so joyful. But when it was awful, it was ever so awful. My dad got dishonorably discharged from the military. He was a very bright man, but he was addicted to, you know. Both my parents drank and they divorced when I was about 12. Before that though, I loved to sing with them. I didn't think I was special because I thought everyone could do it. My mother could sing, my father could sing. Khan is the product of Catholic upbringing. As we stated, she went to the Hyde Park Elementary School associated with St. Thomas the Apostle Church. She said that her grandma was the one who first got her into to jazz. When she was a kid, at the age of 11, Khan and her sister Taka formed a girl group called the Crystalettes after Khan developed an interest in rhythm and blues music. During the late 1960s, Khan and her father's second wife, Connie, who was a passionate civil rights supporter, went to a number of rallies. And in 1967, after becoming friends with Black Panther Party members and Chicago activist Fred Hampton, Khan joined the party. In 1969, Shaka became active in the Black Power Movement, working with the organization's Free Breakfast program for children. And around this time, she took on a new name, Shaka. She also said goodbye to her formal education, dropping out from high school. And despite widespread belief that she was given the name Shaka during her time in the Panthers, she has repeatedly insisted that a Yoruba Babalawo had given it to her when she was 13 years old. And what that is, is like a shadow man, someone who works in the mystical art. As far as her career, she started singing with this band called Rufus as the only female lead and was a sensation. They attracted so much attention so fast. She was 17 years old when they were offered a record deal, still legally a child. When her mother refused to sign a contract on her behalf, she got married to her boyfriend, lying to her parents that she was pregnant so she could get married to him. And in 1973, Rufus signed with ABC Records and released their first debut album. That song, Tell Me Something Good, became the group's breakthrough hit, reaching number three on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1974, later winning the group their first Grammy Award. The single's success and the subsequent follow-up, You Got the Love, which peaked at number 11 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on the R&B chart, helped their second parent album. Rags to Rufus went platinum selling over a million copies. From 1974 to 1979, Rufus released six platinum selling albums including Rufus Sized, Rufus featuring Shaka Khan, Ask Rufus, Street Player, and Master Jam. The band became well known for their live performances and Khan's impressive singing and eccentric stage outfits which included Native American headwear and midriff bearing tops. Khan is also known for her instrumental ability. She knew how to play the drums and the bass and she played percussions with Rufus. And according to The Guardian, despite their success, six gold or platinum albums in the five years, 25 hit singles on the US R&B chart, Rufus were a highly combustible band. There were endless lineup changes. There were fist fights in the studio, issues with managers. She said, I had nothing but rip off artists until just lately. The atmosphere wasn't much help when the record label started billing the band as Rufus featuring Shaka Khan or by tension between the band members and Khan's second husband, Richard Holland. She said, they didn't want me to have a husband. She shrugs. When the band first went on tour every night after a gig, they would all do a walkthrough of my room to make sure I was by myself. They didn't care who it was. No one could 
would come and visit me. They were just very possessive of their little diamond, end quote. Khan's interactions with the band deteriorated, particularly with drummer Andre Fisher. With each new album, several band members quit. Khan remained a member of the band after signing a solo deal with Warner Bros. in 1978. As Khan focused on her solo projects, Rufus put out three albums without her. In 1978, Warner Bros. Records released Khan's solo debut album, which featured the crossover disco hit, I'm Every Woman. The success of the single helped the album go platinum, selling over a million copies. Her discography includes Shaka, which was released in 1978, Naughty, which was released in 1980, What You Gonna Do For Me, 1981, Shaka Khan, 1982, Echoes of an Era, 1982, I Feel For You, 1984, Destiny, 1986, CK, 1988, The Woman I Am, 1992, Come To My House, 1998, Classic Con 2004, Funk This 2007, Hello Happiness 2019. So in every generation, she just had an album out. I love to see it. Date Shaka has won 10 Grammy Awards as stated, including two as a member of Rufus, but she received 22 Grammy Award nominations, including three as a member of Rufus. Towards the end of the 1990s, she established the Shaka Khan Foundation, which provide education programs to at-risk children and helps low-income families with autistic children. Khan was featured in a 2013 episode of Celebrity Ghost stories where she told the story of a shadow man, a mystical man, who followed her on tour for years until she met a guardian angel who admonished her to change her life or die. Mm. Khan has been married twice and has two children. Her first marriage to Hassan Khan when she was 17 ended in divorce a few years later. In 1976, Khan married her second husband, Richard Holland. This is a quote from her on how they met. She said, I was in my 20s and I was singing with the band Rufus. We were taking Coca-Cola, if you know what that means, all day and working 12, 13, 14 hours in the studio. I was having trouble getting any sleep and I was very depressed. I came back home one morning and took a heavy duty sleeping pill. It didn't work, so I took another one. The next thing I know, I'm in an ambulance getting my stomach pumped and they told me that I nearly died. That's how I met my second husband, Richard Holland. He saved my life. He lived next door to me in Laurel Canyon. He said I walked into his house, walked up to his bed, knelt on the floor and collapsed. He didn't feel a pulse and he called 911. End quote. The marriage reportedly caused a conflict between Khan and several Rufus members. Holland tried to persuade her to tone down her sensual stage persona, but she refused. Following their divorce in 1979, Khan spent time in the studio with Ike Turner, whom she described as a real inspiration and catalyst emotionally and in other ways. And during that trying time, Holland filed for divorce in 1980, citing irreconcilable differences. During her solo career in the mid 1980s, Khan dated a Chicago area school teacher. Following Following their divorce, Khan relocated to Europe, first settling in London and later purchasing a home in Germany. She spent some time in Germany in a little village in the Rhine Valley as well as in Mannheim. In 2006, her son Damien Holland was accused of murder after 17-year-old Christopher Bailey was bang banged out if you catch my drift. Khan testified on her son's behalf after a fight inside Khan's home. The two were having a fight and I guess he accidentally you know, took him out. Shaka testified on his behalf and he was acquitted in the criminal trial, And but he was found liable in a civil suit. When asked what her biggest disappointment was, she said that I wasn't able to provide for my children the security they may have needed. I could be wrong, but I think they're still a little angry because I wasn't around when they were young. Like I would have been if I hadn't chosen this life. I think women shouldn't have kids until they're 40 because I don't think we're ready until then, end quote. With all that said, let's get into some of her beef. Shaka Khan had some interesting things to say about Ariana Grande in a recent interview. When asked by Vlad TV if she would want to collaborate with the singer, Shaka responded, F her. Mm. What about Ariana okay, Grande? Okay, no, fuck her. You like Ariana no, Grande? She's all right. She gets, she's good on I'm her a song. Plus, I don't want to sing with another woman. Ugh. I ain't got nothing to say, okay, with a woman. And we ain't gonna talk about no man. <laughs> We're not gonna do none of that stuff. It's not happening. Not gonna do no song with no heifer. So here's the deal. <laughs> they already worked together prior. They released Nobody for the 2019 movie Charlie's Angels. So the world wondered what could have happened between those two. She also has had her issues with Kanye West, who sampled Through the Fire, which was her original tracks. He wants to redo oh. the song, right? What's his name? Let me see. Kanye West. Oh, that rapper dude. Yeah, that little guy. My son used to hang out with him. He said that he had listened to Through the Fire a great deal in his recovery. And that warmed me, my heart, you know. I said, okay, that's beautiful. What do you want? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So he said he wanted to uh, redo the song. I, th I, said, I thought about it, I said, well, he can't mess it up because I will be singing it after all, it's my voice. But he found a way. By golly, he found a way to frick that up. <laughs> but you don't like the little chip? I hate chip it. Monk, uh, I mean, Kitty, come on, girl. Please chip noise. Oh, it was an insult. 
period. I don't, I'm not doing this for money. Mm -hmm. I was very upset with that. Now, as far as Beyonce, so this one came after on the red carpet, an interviewer told Chaka that you looked amazing, you look phenomenal, you look flawless, kind of like the Beyonce song. And she mumbled over her breath and rolled her eyes, that B word. We can't tell you look absolutely flawless like Beyonce's song. How you feel about just to be here? I'm serious though. I mean, you very well put together as always. So. Feel just but she smirked right after and then you know continued to say thank you or anything so probably was playful but uh, you know twitter ran with it the news ran with it she did go on twitter to say immediately there's no beef with beyonce beyonce continue doing you you're doing great and it was just a slow news day and people wanted something to talk about i think she was playing i don't know after seeing the clip what do you guys think i think she was playing because <laughs> she smirked right after it was kind of like you know she was trying to hear what he was saying so i don't think she has beef with beyonce and if she does because shaka is known to speak her mind honey when she had beef with you she got beef with you she speak her mind so if she had beef with her she would have let it be known like you know okay i don't like her so i don't think she'd be running scared for beyonce what do you guys think now as far as her substance use according to the guardian she struggled with addiction to coke Coca-Cola, heroin, and alcohol for most of her adult life. Remarkably, it did not seem to interfere with her career. By her own admission, she said she was getting effed up throughout her commercial peak. And I quote, very good at compartmentalizing. All through the 80s, I knew when to abstain. I really did. I had lines of demarcation in my life and I practiced them. And also I was very aware of my health. That was important to me. When I was with the Panthers, my girlfriends and I were all into breaking our own bread, taking our herbs, fasting one week out of every month. So there were certain other habits I got that I never did stop. It was the healthy living that brought me through drugs alive. I'm sure of it. I would get massively effed up for a couple of weeks and then I'd take like a herbal shutdown where I'd stop and just go on plants. So that helped me a lot. In July 2016, Khan announced that she and her sister Yvonne would be entering rehab due to prescription substance addiction, having made move to do so after the overdose related death of Prince. She stated that, you know, she had surgery and she was in pain all the time from her knee surgery and that she was, you know, taking a lot of painkillers, much like Prince also, and developed an addiction. And she didn't know Prince was going through this and that he passed away from it. And it was kind of like an awakening. She even said his death saved her life because she was like, yo, let me get my life in check and learn how to live with this pain without, you know, constantly having to take these meds. In recent years, she has spent much of her time raising her granddaughter. She won permanent custody after reporting her son and his partner as incapable due to substance use, whom she describes as my best investment and whose own lack of musical ambition seems to delight her. She said, I love it. She's not interested in my stuff. I can't get her to come to a concert and see me sing. She wouldn't give a darn. She doesn't care. She wants to be a doctor. She's so in the right place, end quote. And I'm happy for that with her. Now, she spoke on Whitney. This is not a beef, but Khan has been known to be very vocal about the industry. And when Whitney passed away, she did not hold back because she thought of Whitney as a little sister. I, just, I couldn't get dressed. I was supposed to go to the party. I just got off a plane from Miami at about 5.30. When I, as soon as I hit the, the tarmac, I found out, I heard. And I couldn't, I couldn't put on makeup. I couldn't get dressed. I, I couldn't do anything. I was paralyzed. I, I couldn't do anything. Khan also shared Sharon Osbourne's sentiments of confusion and concern concerning Clive Davis' decision to move forward with his Grammy party after Houston's death and described how the music industry can become a bad influence on stars. And knowing Whitney, I don't believe that she would have said, the show must go on. She's a, she was the kind of woman that would say, stop everything. Uh-uh. I'm not going to be there. I don't know what could motivate a person to have a party in a building where the person whose life he had influenced so so enormously. I don't understand how that I, mean, I had Clive Davis by pure chance in here on Friday night with Jennifer Hudson, and he obviously worshipped Whitney, and I think he must have gone through agony when he heard this news. So that went pretty viral when she said that. She's been known to speak on the industry, you know, the selling of souls, the darkness that goes on there too, but I don't want to make that video about that. YouTube don't like that kind of content. I'm telling y'all, YouTube is shady. I think that we all as artists, because we're highly sensitive people, and this machine around us, this so-called music industry, is such a demonic thing. Uh, it's It sacrifices people's lives and, and their their essences. It reminds me of the time I had a manager once who said to me, actually said to me, you know, you're worth more money dead than alive. 
I love me some Shaka Khan. Like I said, she speaks her mind and she is a legend, had a career that's been decades. And yeah, every now and then there's still little rumors that she, you know, relapsed back on substance if you see some performances. But the industry is a lot. It's a lot. I don't condone, you know, substance use or anything, but and doing these breakdowns for these celebrities, after a while you start to understand like, wow, it's so easy to get into that lifestyle and there's so much depression in it, so much isolation, so much that goes on behind the scene, even in my Nina Simone video that it's just like, dang, you know, they need something to free their mind. And a lot of them for them, like in my vanity video, with Prince to her, it was finding Christ. For many of them, it's finding Christ and changing their life and it transforms them internally for the better. And for many, it's just to leave the industry completely. And unfortunately for many, it's to just die within the industry. It's sad, it's tragic, but comment below your thoughts. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys in the next one. Mm -hmm.